My name's Judy Talley. I'm with PMD Alliance, as is Julie. We're the PMD Alliance team for this presentation. And we've got Kelly Morris and Karen Rossi from the Council of Aging out of Irvine, California, who are going to be our speakers um, and give us this valuable information we all need to know as we get all kinds of scam and uh, spam phones on our uh, phone calls and emails. And um, over the years, I know, you know, it used to be that somebody from a, a a, a country on another continent would tell you about some great deal they had if you just sent them money. But scammers have become much more sophisticated, especially electronically, I think. So this will be good information for all of us. I want to tell you a little bit about Karen and Kelly's um, focus as a council on aging and what those resources may be for any of you. And there are councils on aging throughout the country. But um, it's, of course, its main focus of the council is older adults, but they also are a resource for vulnerable and dependent adults as well. So it's not just um, being older, it's have, being vulnerable, being dependent, and additionally, then the people who care for older adults or are uh, dependent adults. So they've got some great resources. They're kind of a warehouse where you can go and, you know, tell them what you want, and hopefully they've got it on their shelf, and they can head, aim it that information right to you and, and your circumstances. So either prior to an event or a situation during the situation or afterwards when you're trying to recover from a situation, um, think of them as a resource for all of you uh, as the councils of aging across the country um, you know, are there just for us. So um, with that, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, we'll mute you all during the presentation. That way, if your dog barks, you don't have to worry that everybody's hearing it. Um, but we will also unmute you if you want to raise your hand to have a question. So you can raise your hand if you have a question at any time. Or also, if you're familiar with the cat chat feature, you can put your questions in the chat. We'll be looking at that all uh, throughout um, the hour, and so we'll be um, able to see your questions that way as well. Um, PMD Alliance keeps a YouTube library of these kinds of sessions. So in the next couple of days, if uh, you don't get to see it all, um, you know, or know someone else who would benefit from uh, seeing it, you can check our PMD Alliance YouTube library and it will be recorded and you'll be able to get this, this uh, video there. So a couple of resources. Also wanna encourage you, if you haven't signed up for our newsletters, if you're new to PMD Alliance, check out our website at pmdalliance.org, sign up for the things you're interested in receiving information about, and we welcome you to join us in our, our community. So Kelly, Karen, I think it's about time to turn it over to you and find out what you've got to tell us. And then at the end of your conversation, hopefully have some discussion um, throughout the, at the end of the hour. So take it away. All right, that sounds fabulous. So I'm gonna pull up my screen really quick. This is always the tricky part, right? Hoping that the technology works. Uh, let's see here, I want to uh start my slideshow but i'm gonna have to minimize that to do that from the beginning all right everybody can see my slideshow give me a thumbs up all right that's good that's a great way to start so welcome everybody thank you so much for being here we appreciate your time greatly um, as um, was mentioned earlier, I um, am with the Council on Aging, Southern California. We are located in Irvine, and I have the pleasure of serving as the director uh, of the Senior Protection Program. <clears throat> I am also co-chair of the Financial Abuse Specialist Team. And the focus of my program in particular is to go out and talk to folks like you uh, every day. 
I talked to a large uh, age range. Um, I talked to people across a lot of different socioeconomic um, brackets. Uh, we try and present in different languages. Uh, there are a lot of underserved um, monolingual communities here in Orange County who don't get the benefit of these kind of education. And so uh, we're really doing our best to be a full service shop uh, for education. So today we're going to talk about the anatomy of a scam. I know that you've probably attended more than one presentation where they talk about different scams. We're not going to talk about a particular scam today. What we're going to talk about are the elements that are present in any scam. And if you uh, see these elements popping up during a conversation or in an email or text communication, we want you to be skeptical. Could be that the conversation or communication is completely legitimate. But if you start seeing these elements that we're going to talk about today, I want you to practice skepticism, right? Prevention is the key to becoming a victim. Once you become victimized, there's a whole lot of other stuff that comes with that recovery. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how difficult it is for financial recovery in a moment. But today I'm going to walk through first the Council on Aging Programs. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about our older adult population uh, across the U.S. and in Orange County. Um, then I'm going to talk about incidents of financial abuse. Uh, then we're going to walk through the elements of anatomy of a scam. I'm going to talk specifically about cybercrime, which really has become uh, exacerbated since COVID hit, right? With the pandemic came... Uh, some dependence of all of us on electronic tools. And so cyber crime has skyrocketed. Uh, we're gonna talk about what makes people vulnerable to scams. Uh, then we're gonna talk for anybody who happens to be a caregiver or uh, is a friend of someone who might fall into a high risk category. We're gonna talk about things to look for um, to understand if someone actually might be caught up in a scam or might be being exploited. Then we're gonna recap those elements that are uh, common to all uh, scams. <clears throat> and then finally, we're gonna talk about things that you can do to avoid being scammed, right? Some practical things you can do, um, reporting scams, as well as recovering from scams. And then we'll take some questions. In the interest of time, I'm gonna move pretty quickly through this material. Uh, so I apologize if I'm speaking too quick, let me put something in the chat room so Karen can let me know to rein it in a little bit. Um, I tend to speak fast anyway, so I'll try and keep myself under control. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to move forward now. So Council on Aging serves about 290,000 seniors every year. We have just 80 employees to accomplish this feat. That means we are volunteer driven. Uh, we have uh, in excess of you know, 400 volunteers at any moment in time who give us about 23,000 hours of service every year to help us serve the Orange County population. We have about $4.6 million in income or revenue. Most of that comes from government funding. However, we do also receive donations from uh, individuals, foundations, and corporations. We have a lot of programs. So the Council on Aging itself is a big umbrella. And under that umbrella, we have programs that are focused on advocacy and protection, socialization and wellness, and or mental wellness, um, and then education and outreach. Uh, my program happens to serve a couple of these categories. Uh, we are advocates for protection. Uh, we're also out there doing education and outreach. Uh, we house the Ombudsman program for both Orange County and Riverside counties. Ombudsmen are advocates for people who live in uh, a facility, whether that be assisted living, skilled nursing, uh, board and care. Um, and so the Ombudsman We'll take any kind of complaint and investigate it. It could be something that sounds silly to you and I, but for example, uh, I pay $4,500 a month to live here and I've not had one hot meal since I moved in and that's part of my 
package? Why am I not getting hot meals, right? And maybe we need to look into, is the kitchen observing proper food preparation? You know, is the temperature right when they're preparing the food? Why is the food always cold when it's served? May not sound a lot uh, like a big deal to you and I, but you know, these are the, the ombudsmen or advocates for people who live in facilities and they're gonna investigate any complaint, no matter how small it might seem. We also do a lot of joint work with ombudsmen. <clears throat> when we talk about abuse going on in a facility, people oftentimes think of the facility staff or the owners of the facilities. Um, in actuality, a lot of times someone who lives in assisted living may still own a home and a car and still have active bank accounts uh, outside of the place where they live. And oftentimes we find that there is someone in the community, it could even be a family member, is, uh, has access to those assets and is using them without permission um, or maybe not in that person's best interest. So we do a lot of joint work with the ombudsman um, and uh, that would oftentimes uh, require us to include adult protective services who are the cousins of the ombudsman, so to speak. Adult protective services protects individuals who live independently, right, in their own home, in a room rented somewhere, and the ombudsman protect individuals who are living in a facility. So many times all three of us, uh, all three of these programs are working together to straighten out a complicated mess. Um, Council on Aging also uh, houses the HICAP program, and that is the Health Insurance Counseling and Advocacy Program. We are the Medicare sanctioned nonprofit organization to provide free Medicare counseling to anyone who's eligible for Medicare, whether you're already enrolled um, and want to know if the plan that you have is the best plan for you or if you're new to uh, Medicare, just entering the Medicare system uh, and feel very confused by all the different parts and pieces that come with Medicare. Uh, we don't represent any insurance company. It is not our job to sell you anything. Our job is to take your information, put it into a computer, and then print out a list of the plans that suit your needs the best, make sure that your doctors are covered under a plan or that the medications you take are covered under a particular plan. And then it's up to you to take care of your own enrollment. We also have a friendly visitor program, which is for adults who are living in the community, but they're no longer able-bodied, meaning they can't get out really and socialize. Um, and so they're isolated. And I'll tell you the number one risk for uh, abuse and exploitation is being isolated. People who do not have contact with others are easy to take advantage of because there's no one to see what's going on. There's no one to tell what's going on. Um, and so the, the point of the friendly visitor program is to make sure that individuals who are isolated have communication with the world. So our program matches our participants with either volunteers or staff members of our friendly visitor program. And then the volunteers or staff members will visit the participant at least once a week. They'll make sure that all of their medical um, and general uh, care needs are being met. Do they have groceries? Uh, do they have food? Or if they're not capable of preparing food, um, should they be uh, receiving meals on wheels? Right, it's very much a whole person care program to make sure that the person who is isolated is getting everything they need and they have a lifeline to the outside world. Sadly, once again, we do a lot of joint work with our friendly visitors. We often get calls about a person who's suddenly shown up at the house and is living with the participant and they're supposed to be doing home repairs and the care went with through $10,000. I'm getting some feedback here, sorry. There, I just muted someone, sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll find out that money's been withdrawn, but there are no home repairs being done. Um, and we wanna question what really is this person's intention? Why is this person in this person's home? 
and what are they doing? Are they really there to do good or are they there to take advantage of someone who's otherwise isolated? And that's just one example. There are a million others I could give, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to. <laughs> um, we also have a reconnect program, which is kind of the sister program of our friendly visitor program. The difference is our reconnect participants are actually able-bodied and they can get out and socialize and attend events. However, for one reason or another, they become disconnected from their community. Um, and so they find themselves starting to feel isolated. Uh, an example would be someone who's been married for many, many years and they lose their spouse. And then they decide to move closer to their children and grandchildren. And once they get to this new community, they quickly realize that their children work all day. And when they're not working, they're running their grandchildren around to different activities. And they find themselves very isolated and alone in a new community. Sometimes people move from a rural area into like an area like Orange County, where there's a lot of traffic, a lot of aggressive drivers. Um, and that's another hurdle to getting out and about in the community is because they don't feel confident. They don't know where they're going. They feel intimidated. Um, and so this can create uh, quite an obstacle for people in getting out and establishing some presence and friendships in that community. So our reconnect program is a 12 month program and our participants um, are assigned to a caseworker. The caseworker finds out what their passions are, what kind of activities they'd like to attend. And then that caseworker actually attends different activities with them in the community. So you're not like the new kid at school and everyone's looking at you when you walk into a room, you're actually walking in with a friend um, and the hope is that over time, not only will the participants realize different activities that they like to do and participate in, but also that they'll establish new friendships in the community. They'll learn how to get around in their community, whether that's by driving or using, you know, some form of public transportation. Um, and, you know, the point again, as the name suggests, is to become reconnected. It's a very successful program. Very few people stay in that program for 12 months. And a majority of our participants come back as peer mentors to help other people who are new to a community and just you know, getting started on a new journey um, to help them kind of assimilate. So uh, really, really fabulous program. We have a Smile Makers program. So every year we recognize that there are people who are in facilities who do not participate in holiday activities, either because no one comes to visit them and or they're not gonna receive any kind of gift during the holidays so that they can open a gift with everyone else at that holiday party. So the ombudsman throughout Orange and Riverside counties will identify people who are probably not going to participate. And then we, uh, ask these individuals if they could have one gift, what would it be? We take those wishes, we put them on little gold angels and hang them on Christmas trees like ornaments. We adopt the trees out into the community. Uh, once the wishes are fulfilled on the back of those gold angels, they call us, we pick up those gifts, we bring them back to our workshop, we put them in beautiful boxes with tissue paper and wrap them in Christmas wrap. And we deliver those individual packages to every single individual at every facility to make sure that they are part of that holiday celebration <clears throat> and get to participate and open a gift uh, during the holiday parties. Um, I think last year we got very close to 7,000 gifts. Um, and if some of you are wondering why it is that people would be in a facility and not be receiving a gift or not participating. Many people in facilities um, are no longer in contact with their family, oftentimes because of dementia or Alzheimer's. They don't really recognize their family members anymore. And so people tend to stop visiting. Uh, it's also the case that many of us have family members who live on a different coast or somewhere else in the country, and it's very expensive to travel during the holidays. Um, and so oftentimes people just kind of put that off and they quit visiting during the holidays and they pick other times that are more convenient and less expensive to travel. 
But regardless, we have a lot of older adults and dependent adults uh, throughout Orange County and Riverside County who really get a pick me up from this program and they feel really wonderful about participating. And more importantly, I think we get great joy out of the fact that everyone gets to participate and open a gift that puts a smile on their face. Um, it's sad we can only do it once a year, but that's our focus is around the holidays. We also have one for-profit program and that is our concierge care navigators. This is a program for people who are looking for assistance with caregiving. If you're a new caregiver and you've never done it before and you just have no idea uh, what to do, or if you're a caregiver and you think you had all uh, the pieces to the puzzle to care for somebody and you find yourself in over your head, um, this is an excellent program to help you figure that out. It is an array of services that can either be very short term, you know, one um, report, one meeting, one interview, so that they can put together a plan of action for you, or it could continue on over the course of someone's lifetime. Everything is shared electronically, so you can share it with other family members if you're caring as a family unit um, and you all want to participate in it, they can make it available to a family electronically. Um, and in any case, it's a fabulous program. Uh, if you ever need help, please call us. We are happy to refer you to Concierge Care Navigators. Um, they saved my life. I was a caregiver for my mother in the last years of her life. And I thought I knew what I was doing because of what I do for a living. And let me tell you, I knew nothing about what I was doing. <laughs> so I couldn't have done it without them. All right, moving on. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about our Orange County population. So based on the 2010 census, there were about 500,000 individuals aged 65 and over in Orange County. And based on that number, the projection was that by 2040, we were gonna see that almost double to about 700,000 individuals aged 65 and over. And then when we look out beyond that, actually another 10 years to 2050, the projections um, get even wilder. So when we look across the United States, um, the projection is that the population of individuals 65 and over is going to double by the year 2050. It's gonna go from about 43 million to about 84 million. And this was the surprising um, statistic for me, individuals 85 and over, that population is going to triple in 2050. So we're gonna go from 6 million strong to 18 million strong. Now that's all very good news in my opinion. It means we're uh, you know, obviously doing better at living longer. We're probably having better quality of life. We recognize life doesn't end at 65 when you retire. Um, and we have more time to spend with our families. We're probably more active uh, later into life. Um, and so these are all good things, right? But, but there's always a but, right? This growth in population also presents more opportunity for people to be taken advantage of, right? And this is what we're seeing as of that population grows, so do the incidents of fraud and exploitation. So we talk a lot about financial abuse because it is the fastest growing, most underreported crime targeting both older adults and dependent adults or people who have particular susceptibilities. Unfortunately, California is leading the nation in financial abuse. So 11% of all cases reported nationally of financial abuse come from California. We don't know what the reason for that is. We don't know if it's that we have a particularly high concentration of wealth. We don't know if it's because we're just better at reporting um, and have a better system for people to report. What we do know is we're outpacing the nation and that's never a good thing when we're talking about financial abuse. So we do a lot of education in this area. Um, <clears throat> one of the best ways to avoid becoming a victim of financial abuse, <clears throat> excuse me, is to recognize a scam and stop it in its tracks before you do become a victim. 
And so today we're going to talk about the anatomy of the scam. And these are things that you see in every single scam, no matter the facts change. Uh, it could be a com sound completely different on the surface, but they all have these common elements. And if you can recognize these elements, chances are you're going to be really good at avoiding becoming a victim. So these are the four things that we see that happened almost with every single scam without exception. The first thing is you receive some unsolicited contact, meaning I'm not expecting the phone call, I'm not expecting that email, and it could either be from a stranger or it could be from a trusted source, like it looks like it's coming from my child, looks like it's coming from a grandkid, it's someone that I went to high school with is reaching out to me through Facebook. Um, you know, in, in any case, I'm not expecting that <clears throat> contact. It could also be contact, for example, from an institution, my bank. I'm not expecting a call from them. They don't call me. So if I get a call from them, that's unexpected. It's unsolicited. I didn't call them and say, hey, I want someone to call me back about my loan. That's not the kind of call I'm talking about. I'm talking about a completely unexpected email or text or call from someone, a trusted source, family member, institution. That's always how it starts, unexpected contact. The second thing that we see is that there's always an offer of something that's valuable specifically to you, right? So. I'm only going to get caught up in something if it's of value to me. If someone is offering me a back brace and I don't have a bad back, I'm not going to respond to that offer. So it's always a very specific offer and someone gets drawn in because the offer is valuable to them. Uh, for As an example, when I turned 55, um, I joined AARP. And I got so many solicitations from different people about senior this and senior that. I started getting coupons from Denny's for the senior menu. Suddenly everybody knows my age, right? And, and they're sending me these offers that of course are valuable to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can go to Denny's and eat breakfast for $2.19 on the senior menu, right? So they're very good about targeting at you. They obviously have information about us and they use that information to make an offer to us, <clears throat> excuse me, that they think will be of value. <clears throat> the next thing that always occurs is there is inevitably a request for personal and or financial information, right? Uh, this deal is only good to the first 25 people who respond. So if you want these $25 gift cards for $10 a piece, you have to be one of the first 25 to respond. Um, and so put in your uh, credit card information so you can get the purchase done. Um, and suddenly I'm giving them both my personal information and my financial information. Another example, let's go back to my bank calling me saying there's something wrong with your ATM card. And so we've put a freeze on it until you respond to this link in this email and confirm that you're, you're in possession of your uh, debit card. And we just need you to confirm your date of birth and social security number and address, right? So now suddenly I'm putting in information and I'm confirming my ATM debit card number in response to this unexpected email from my bank and what's the something that's valuable to me? Being able to use my ATM card, right? Of course, that's extremely valuable to me. So I'm going to be drawn into that and probably willing to respond and give them whatever information they need so I can continue to use my ATM card. Um, <clears throat> people tend to think that if you don't give your financial information out, that you really haven't made yourself vulnerable. I would disagree with that. It is my personal belief and experience that sometimes your personal information is more valuable even than your credit card or banking information. I can catch fraudulent activity on my bank card and stop that. Um, I can 
sometimes the bank will even call me because they are seeing activity that they think might be fraudulent. On the other hand, once my personal information is out into the world, it can be sold over and over and over again by different companies. And then that makes me more and more vulnerable because now I'm going to be the target of more and more people trying to sell me things or trying to take advantage of me, right, and scam me. Um, and the more people who have my information, the more vulnerable I am. And I don't think in this day and age, we think much about giving out our personal information. Anytime you want to register for an event, for example, you have to give up some personal information. Uh, when you go <clears throat> to your doctor's office, all right, they want you to not only identify yourself with a, your um, ID, but they also will ask you for your health insurance card, right? And I'm sharing these things with them and I'm not thinking anything about them. But those, those pieces of information give other people a lot of information about me. And identity thieves who may then use my identity to buy a piece of property or open a new bank account or open a credit card in my name only need a couple pieces of information, right, to perpetrate identity theft. So your personal information is just as valuable, if not more valuable, than your financial information. Because if someone has opened a credit card account in my name, I may not know that right away. It may take me years to find that out when the collection notices start coming because now there's a $20,000 credit card bill that's unpaid in my name. Uh, so so it, it's very important to think about not only sharing financial information with people you're not sure who they are, as just as it, it's more important to think about sharing your personal information in those same circumstances. Um, and finally, the last thing that we see is this pressure to act quickly or you're going to lose out on that opportunity, right? Sometimes that's an internal pressure. Uh, as an example, if someone called me and said, uh, this is Social Security and Kelly, we can't make a deposit into your bank account. I think we have something went wrong with your bank number and we need you to reconfirm your banking information so we can get your social security check to you. Well, that's going to be me putting internal pressure on myself because I need my money. So I'm going to be more apt to respond to that very quickly in that situation because I can't afford to be without my social security check. It's my only source of income. And so now I have this internal pressure to act quickly. Or it could be someone who's trying to give me a tip, someone from church who has a great investment opportunity and it's only going to be for the first five friends who respond. And I'm like, my goodness, I don't want to miss out on that opportunity. I want to be one of the first five. So I'm going to feel pressure to act quickly or miss out on that great deal. These four elements, no matter how the scam is painted or what the details are, you will see these come up in every single scam that is out there and being perpetrated today. Now we're gonna kind of walk through some examples and I'm not gonna get very deep in those because I'm sure you hear about these and you, you experience them on a regular basis because they're all very uh, popular and familiar. So most scams are what we call imposter scams, meaning someone is pretending to be someone or something that they're not. And here are some examples of imposter scams, right? <clears throat> your social security number has been frozen. We, you know, someone's been using your number and we need you to call in and give us some information so that we can unfreeze your social security number and get either your retirement or your disability benefits to you. Uh, IRS, there's a lawsuit because you haven't paid your taxes. And if you don't pay right away, uh, we're going to, you know, come and arrest you, or we're going to put a lien on your home. Um, there's a warrant for my arrest because I failed to show up in court. I was supposed to be on jury duty and I didn't show up. Uh, and so now there's a warrant for my arrest and all I have to do is, you know, make a payment over the phone and they won't come and arrest me and they'll drop it and they'll put me back on the jury duty schedule. So let's walk through some of these elements. So I'm going to be contacted by social security 
Am I expecting Social Security to call me? Probably not. Um, if, if I call them and they're calling me back about a matter, that's a different story. But this call that I'm talking about, telling me that my security number, Social Security number has been frozen and or there's something wrong with my bank account, right? This is an unexpected call. What's the valuable offer there for me? Having access to my social security number and or my social security benefits. Um, they're gonna ask me to give them some information so they can straighten out the matter. Chances are I'm gonna be giving them both personal information to identify myself and then if it's a bank account issue, I'm also going to confirm my bank account number, right? So there's number three. And then finally, I'm going to want this to be cleared up quickly because I don't want to be without access to my social security money and or my social security number, right? If I need to apply for credit or something, I can't have some kind of hold on my social security number. <clears throat> Same with the IRS. IRS never calls anyone right? It is very rare that you would get a call from the IRS. You'll get 20 letters at nauseum, right? And they're going to try and reach you in a paper format. Um, so I'm already going to be skeptical if I get a call from the IRS, but it can be scary to get a call from the IRS. What's the value of the IRS calling me and saying there's a lawsuit against me for unpaid taxes? Well, the value is, first of all, not having the IRS breathing down my neck. <laughs> and second of all, not having some debt that might cause the IRS to put a lien against my assets um, or just make my life miserable in general with collection calls. Um, <clears throat> they're going to ask me to give them either money to pay my unpaid taxes. And of course, they're going to want me to identify myself to make sure that they are talking to Kelly Morris. So I'm gonna give them some personal information. And then of course, again, the pressure for me is internal. They're gonna encourage me to pay it quickly to avoid a lien or a lawsuit moving forward. But I, there's also gonna be internal pressure for me to take care of that problem because I don't want this, right? I don't want a lien, I don't want a lawsuit, I want out of this mess. So as you see, all of these elements are there. Call now for your free back brace. Seems pretty innocuous, right? But in order to get that back brace, not only am I gonna to have to give them my personal information, including my mailing address, but I'm probably gonna to have to give them my Medicare card, right? Or some other health insurance card to qualify for that back brace. So I'm giving up this information and maybe I really need that back brace. And I'm thinking, wow, I could use a new back brace and it's free. So sure, I'm going to give up that information. And, and they may even tell me there's only 25, you know, to be uh, given out under this particular special. So I may have uh, pressure from the salespeople uh, to give them that information and act quickly. And or I just may want a new brace very quickly because I'm in an excruciating pain. And that back brace sounds pretty good to me. Um, so as you can see, no matter how diverse the stories are, they all kind of have the same four elements that drive me to maybe get caught up in these scams. Now, when COVID-19 hit, of course, uh, especially when we were all under lockdown, and I will tell you, even today, I'm very careful about going public places because <clears throat> I have some chronic illnesses and I am concerned about getting sick. Um, and so I've become very dependent, just like today, here we are meeting virtually um, on these electronic tools. And so with this dependence, this new dependence uh, on tools came a huge uptick in what they call cyber crime. So the Federal Trade Commission noted that from January 1st of 2020 to June 30th of 2020, there had already been a reported total loss of $75 million due to fraud. And that was all attributed to cybercrime. So these criminals wasted no time. As soon as they recognized people were locked down in their home and would have to be dependent on the internet and their phones, boy, they just started pushing those scams immediately. And what kind of stories did they tell? Well, again, the stories always have some 
uh, sound of legitimacy, right? That, so for example, this time it was about these, remember our stimulus checks that we got? So people were getting calls saying this is the IRS and we're trying to deposit your stimulus check, but there's something wrong with your bank account. Um, and so we just need you to confirm your bank account number so we can get that check into your account today. Well, that sounds legitimate. So first of all, I'm receiving an unsolicited contact from the IRS. What's valuable to me? My stimulus check. Uh, they just need me to confirm my banking information. So I'm handing over financial information. And then finally, I want to do it quickly because I want my money, right? That $1,400 is just waiting there for me. Um, and maybe I'm somebody who is, you know, was working when the pandemic hit and now I have no income. This is, and I don't qualify yet for maybe retirement income. This might be really valuable to me. Right. And then we had people calling saying they were from the CDC um, and they were saying, hey, you've been exposed to COVID. And so we need to know who you've been around for the last 14 days. Right. Well, of course, I'm not expecting a call from the CDC. Um, and what's valuable to me is knowing that I've been exposed to COVID, my goodness. And I probably exposed everybody I've been in contact with for the last 14 days. And so I'm going to give them not only my personal information, but personal information of everybody else that I've been around for the last 14 days. So they're getting a whole slew of information from me on this one single call. And of course, I'm going to act quickly because I want people to be notified as soon as possible that they may have been exposed to COVID. Well, I didn't give them any financial information, so I'm thinking everything's great, but what did I do? I turned over not only my personal information, but information of a lot of people. So not only are these people now at risk for being scammed, but now this person knows they can send something from me. Looks like it's coming from Kelly Morris because they know these people to be part of my inner circle, uh, which makes whatever scam they're going to try even more believable because now it's tied to me. Um, so as you see, these four elements are present uh, even in these cyber uh, crimes, these you know cyber scams, um, and they exist just the way they do in uh, other scams that are perpetrated, you know, maybe in person or by telephone. It doesn't matter the mode uh, in which you are scammed. What matters are recognize these elements to avoid getting drawn into that scam. So when we talk about cyber scams in particular, even before COVID, right? If we look at 2018, these are FBI statistics. We find that people over the age of 60 are particularly vulnerable to cyber scams, right? They're, they are the most uh, prominent age group of people taken advantage of. So their total count is very large and they lost the largest amount of money, right? Now, why is that? Again, is it because older adults probably have more money because they probably have a nest egg and so they probably have access to larger sums of money to lose at one time? Um, and why are people over 60 more vulnerable to these kind of scams? Is it because we just trust ourselves too much and think, oh, this can't be a scam, I know it. Is it because we are less uh, tech savvy, right? When it comes to being on the internet and doing business with these electronic tools, we don't know the answer. We just know that this is the case. People over 60 lose more money every year to cyber crimes um, and we're the highest number of victims fall into this age category. And bad news again, if we look state by state, we can see that California in 2019 had the greatest number of victims of cybercrime with the greatest financial loss. So again, we are outpacing the nation. We have to ask ourselves, are we really or do we just report more financial crime? We don't know the answer. We just know that we always fall at the top of the list and, and this is not a good thing right? We want to do our best to avoid being at the top of that list. So one of the things that we can do 
is recognize that there are certain things that make us more vulnerable to scams, right? And we need to be cognizant of that for ourselves as well as other people in our circle, in our orbit. So, of course, there's cognitive and physical impairments, right? This is for people, not just older adults. This occurs to people who have any kind of disease or disease process, um, who may be dependent, and we may be independent, but we're still more at risk because we have cognitive or physical impairments that will make us necessarily more dependent on other people, right? We're going to need some assistance. Um, and even if we if that assistance comes in the forms of different tools that we use, for example, if I have a cognitive impairment and I need to remember to take my medications, you know, then I'm going to have a tool to do that. Well, the more dependent I become on tools, um, or for example, I put my bills on auto pay. So I don't look at my bank account anymore because everything's on auto pay. Well, now I'm at high risk because I'm no longer checking my bank account every week, right? Because I know everything's getting paid and I just, I'm not bothering with it anymore. And that makes me at more risk, right? For abuse, fraud, exploitation, health and medical problems of any kind. Um, this is also the case for people who have depression, uh, anxiety and trauma. I'm not sure who we're hearing, but I have a lot of feedback. Um, you know, someone who is depressed, and looking for um, some solace um, is necessarily going to um, be more at risk just generally because we're looking for a way to feel better. And more importantly, people who have depression, anxiety, trauma tend to be self-isolative, right? So they're gonna be probably less socially active um, and that's true too when you have health and medical problems. If you have a bad back um, and you get invited to dinner, you may pass because you're not going to be able to sit through the entire dinner. You may have to get up, walk around every 15 minutes. Um, and so again, you're going to be more isolated. Grief and loss, boy, this is something that I hear all the time. People who've been married for a long time and their kids don't call them and they get caught up in these sweetheart romance scams. And they'll say to me, Kelly, I know this person probably isn't at all who I think they are. I've never seen them. I've only talked to them on the phone. Yes, I've sent them money, but guess what? They call me every day. I have something to look forward to every day. I pick up that phone and there's somebody on the other end and suddenly I don't miss my husband or my wife so much, right? Or I don't miss my dog, Charlie, so much because somebody's actually paying attention to me and checking in on me. Um, and that leads to our next bullet point, loneliness, right? People who are lonely tend to be the highest risk category um, for financial exploitation because you do just about anything to not be lonely. And that's even let people take advantage of you. Um, and Karen can attest to this. We've had many people tell us, you know, the only reason my kids are worried about me talking to this person is because they're afraid I'm going to give their money, quote unquote, their inheritance to this person. And you know what? Too bad. I realize that I may give, be giving money away to somebody who's no good, somebody who's a total criminal, but guess what? They call me and my kids don't. So that's the price I'm paying to have a companion and someone to check up on me. Um, and we see it time and time again. Financial dependence is another issue. If you are uh, unable to live by yourself and you have someone move into your home or you move into someone else's home so that they can help you with, you know, daily activities, cooking, grocery shopping, there becomes this interdependence. Um, people become financially dependent on you, right? So they can take advantage of you. They hit a little bump in the road. They get fired from their job, suddenly have no income. Well, I have access to Kelly's bank account. So I'll just borrow $1,000 from her and pay her back when I get back to work. And by the time that person gets back to work, they don't have any extra money. They have bills that need to be paid off um, and they don't have that $1,000 to put back into my account. 
I can also become financially dependent on others, which makes me really vulnerable. Okay, Kelly, well, we're going to just take your retirement check. And in return for that, you'll get food and a bed and someone to help you, you know, shower and bathe. Um, but you're not going to have any spending money. So you're going to be completely dependent on us. And you're going to do everything we say and the way that we say to do it. Um, because, you know, we have control of your money. So all of these things make people more vulnerable. And what is sitting at the core of all of that is this issue of capacity, right? So when we start to lose our capacity, um, and let's talk about simple examples. As we get older, we lose the ability to drive. Um, and that is a big um, loss for most of us. Um, but it's, it, is a, it is an element of capacity. We're no longer able to react quickly. Maybe I just feel too flustered to be out driving in this Orange County traffic anymore. Um, maybe I have um, neuropathy in my bilateral feet and I can no longer feel the pedals and I just really shouldn't be driving. Um, maybe I have some movement disorder and I can't control my movement. And so I'm really kind of dangerous behind the wheel. Uh, there's that kind of capacity. There's the loss of financial capacity, right? I'm no longer able to really balance my checkbook and I seem to be making a lot of financial mistakes. Um, that could be simply, that could be a medication side effect. It could be because I have a, a urinary tract infection, it could be something temporary, or it could be something more permanent. Maybe I'm having some cognitive decline. Regardless, capacity is always at the core when we are asked to determine if someone is being taken advantage of, being exploited. We have to ask, did they understand what they were doing when they entered into this uh, you know, scam or were taken in by this person? Um, or allow this person to move into their home? It's a very difficult question to ask because there's a lot of different elements to capacity. And under California state law, it's extremely complicated. But the one thing I'd like everyone to understand is that in the state of California, every resident who lives here is presumed to have capacity. That means you and I have the ability to make decisions in our own best interest without question, right? The, the state of California recognizes that that is how everyone is until a court of law says otherwise. So when we talk about it being complicated, it's much like autism. It used to be that you either were uh, severely autistic or maybe you had what they called Asperger's autism, meaning you were highly functioning. Over time, the medical community recognized that uh, people could have different levels of autism. Some were better at functioning than others and some functioned in certain areas better than others. And so now if you're diagnosed with autism, you're diagnosed on what's called the autism spectrum and you can fall Anywhere along that spectrum, meaning you could have really severe disabilities, you can't talk, can't take care of your own activities of daily living, or you may work, live on your own, function on your own, or you may live in a group home and need some assistance with some things. You may live with a family member who has conservatorship and just manages your financial affairs, but otherwise you function independently. Well, capacity is much the same way. Right. And before I move on, what I mean by that is I may have the ability to cook my own meals, but maybe I shouldn't be entering into a real estate contract. Maybe I don't actually have the money that I think I have to support the payment of that you know, piece of property over 30 years. Or maybe someone's really taking advantage of me by selling me a car that's not worth what I'm paying for it because I don't recognize that. Um, and so, you know, capacity, when it's determined, a judge can say, well, I think Kelly can live by herself, but maybe she should have someone help managing, you know, payment of her bills and or any kind of big purchase she wants to make, right? So 
Um, it's really important to recognize that there's this underlying thing that makes us very vulnerable. And just because someone has, for example, Alzheimer's doesn't mean they can't make their own decisions, right? Alzheimer's is a progressive disease and you may retain your capacity for many, many years, right? Um, and so it gets really complicated. It's a good thing that the state of California protects us and, and presumes that all of us have capacity. It can also be a very bad thing because that means I can do whatever I wanna do until a court of law says otherwise, even if it's not in my own best interest, like give this crook from uh, Eastern Europe my money who I think is someone who loves me and is my new companion that I've been communicating with for the last two years of my life, right? Um, and if you happen to be a caregiver, or let's say you're just a really good neighbor and you're seeing some strange things, or, or you have, um, you know, you watch your neighbor who gets out in gardens every morning and they're much older than you are and you just are a, a good person at heart, there are some red flags that you can watch out for when we're talking about seeing these things in other people that may tell you that they're being victimized, right? Maybe they're being taken advantage of. So some of the obvious things we see is, is suddenly somebody has like this new friend or new love interest and they're very enthusiastic about it, right? Um, or someone who is not typically on a computer or doesn't necessarily use their phone a lot suddenly is on their phone or on their computer all day long, right? This might be a hint that somebody's trying to take advantage of them and lure them into some kind of relationship um, that may not be in their best interest. Um, if you see somebody who, uh, for example, my grandmother always wore this beautiful cocktail ring um, and it would be very noticeable if she showed up anywhere without that ring. I, I would notice that immediately. Um, and that might tell me that maybe she's given that ring to someone else, which would concern me. Um, or more importantly, Maybe she's um, spending money that she shouldn't spend. And in order to hide that, she's actually pawned her jewelry or sold her jewelry um, so that she can continue to do this thing that she doesn't want anyone to know she's doing. Uh, secretive behavior, right? If people are, if I walk into my mom's house and the mail is always on the counter and now suddenly there's no mail anywhere uh, because she doesn't want me to see these communications or maybe she's not paying her bills because she's spending her money doing other things she shouldn't necessarily be doing. Uh, this can be a real clue to me that something's going on. Taking calls in private, right? Excusing themselves to go into a room and take private calls, whispering, uh, unusual purchases, things that don't really make sense. You know, an automotive magazine, you know, for an 85 year old woman doesn't make any sense. Not so obvious, maybe change in appearance or hygiene habits, right? If you see someone wearing lipstick, that might be a clue that there's some kind of romantic thing going on. If you see a decline in their appearance, that may indicate that there's a financial issue going on. Change in behavior. If they're giddy and seem happy and over the moon, again, it could be a sign that they're in one of these romance scams. If they seem particularly angry or depressed, could be something else going on. Could be a, a financial thing. Maybe they've been taken advantage of and they don't want to talk to anybody about it because they're embarrassed about it. Uh, if they seem depressed, maybe they were in a romance scam. Now this person's quit talking to them and where they realize that they're out $20,000 and have no romance. Um, unmet basic needs, lack of medication, lack of food, again, could signal a change in finances. So uh, quickly, I'm sorry, I'm running over time here, but let's go through our recap. Unsolicited contact from a stranger or trusted source, number one. Number two, offering something that's valuable to you. That is the hook. It's got to be something of value to you. How do they get that? Because they have personal information. Our personal information is out in the world. Um, then there's going to be a request for personal and or financial information. And finally, there is always pressure to act quickly, and that can either be internally imposed or it can be whoever's trying to scam you saying, come on, do it, do it, do it now. Um, <clears throat> and then what can you do? Watch for those four red flags. Those are the things that happen in every scam. Talk amongst yourselves. If you hear of a new scam, share it with your friends, families, clubs, friend groups. Um, if you feel like you've been the victim of a scam, 
report it. Adult Protective Services will take reports from anyone who's living independently in the community and call your ombudsman if you live in a facility or you know someone who lives in a facility. Um, and then, of course, you need to recover. <clears throat> it's important if you have to make 50 phone calls because someone is using your identity that you enlist an advocate because you're only going to be able to make so many calls before you just get frustrated. So get someone to come and help you, whether that's a somebody at Council on Aging or just a good friend or your neighbor. Um, you can always seek legal advice to find out, do I have a legal cause of action? It's better to find out. And, and they may tell you you don't, but here's what we would recommend for you. Um, and of course, understand your available resources. If anything happens, call us. If we're not the resource for you, we can get you to a resource for whatever it is that you need to help you recover. Um, and I think that's it for me. I'm sorry, it looks like I went over time here. Kelly, we have a couple questions that came up in the chat box. Okay. First one is, describe or discuss some ways to address unwanted emails. Is unsubscribing effective? Uh, unsubscribing is very effective. Um, the other thing that I would do, and I often do this, um, even uh, before I'm, uh, I unsubscribe, I will send an email uh, and it says, do not send emails to this address. It's a, it's a, you know, do not reply address. I always send an email just to say, deceased insist, I'm not interested in your product, quit contacting me. The problem again that we come up against over and over and over again is your personal information is out there. When I go to buy something on Amazon, I log in with my email address. Everybody knows my email address. Um, and so it's really quite difficult to get those emails from coming in. So if you have the time to hit unsubscribe or if you get a text message that's unwanted, you can, it says reply stop and we'll keep sending you those texts and I will take the time to you know, reply stop. Uh, but chances of us ever having a clean slate and not getting any un unwanted emails or text messages or even phone calls, right, are, are not like because our information is out in the world. We live in an in information um, era. The second question is, how do I address or recognize unscrupulous contractors like roofers, solar panel sales, and home repairs? Yeah, so in our uh, recovery guide, we actually have a number that you can contact uh, to, to actually not only at a website where you can go and look up the record of contractors to see if there are any complaints against them uh, and you could also make a complaint through the Contractors Association here in California. The other thing that I do quite often is I will just Google that business name and then see what comes up. I will go, of course, to Better Business Bureau. But if you just put Google in, you'd be surprised. If you just go to the internet, type in that company name, you'd be surprised how much information you get about, you know, reviews from people that may not show up on Yelp because those are pushed down and the better reviews rise to the top or on that company's website, they may again, push those to the bottom. So you never see the bad reviews. You only see the good reviews. But when you go to Google, that doesn't always happen. You get a lot of good information just by typing a company name in and seeing what comes up and then looking through everything that pops up. It's a, it's a good idea. Kelly, it looks like Jerry has asked for the link to the recovery guide you mentioned. Can so you what I'll do is I will have Karen send that to you and then you can send it to all of your attendees. We'll send the electronic format. Uh, we have it in English. If you need it in Spanish, Korean, or Vietnamese, we have it in those three languages as well. Okay. And Karen, do you have that available now or that you could put in the chat or is that something you need to find? Um. I think I can put it in the chat. Let me see if I can. Otherwise, I will just send it on to you guys and you can distribute it out to everyone via email. Yeah, well, that the, since we don't know everybody that's on with us and their emails, that may be not quite as effective if you can find it. 
All right, let me just check and see if I can pull it up in there. No, I'm not sure that she can load it. Might be. Yeah, that's well, what I'm thinking. I'm not sure if I can. It. Yeah, if it's, it's not, it's not necessarily a link. It's oh. an actual PDF. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so that that's what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, we, could add it, we could add the PDF yeah. to the recording online. Okay, we'll add it there. Thanks, Julie. Perfect. We'll add it there. That's perfect. So if you just send it to Julie. Okay. Um, she'll be able to get that up for you yeah, right. we're, we're right so, in the process of renovating our website so the yeah. course all the links are down at this moment okay so jerry give us time to get the uh, recording up for this and you'll probably find it what towards the end of the uh, right. recording yeah and, and jerry if you if you want to type your email address into the chat box after i told everybody not to give out your personal information <laughs> um anyway <laughs> Karen will take it and send you a copy of the right now so you don't have to wait. Okay. Yeah, at the very well, beginning, I put my email in. If anybody wanted to contact me, it's krossi at coasc.org. Feel free to contact me. There's never a bad question. If there's anything that we can do to help you, we certainly will try. Okay, that's great. Kelly and Karen, thank you so much. I want everybody to know, I know that their reference point was California, but Council on Aging, Area Agency on Aging there throughout the country. Um, so you can check in with your local group, whatever region you happen to be in. And um, we really appreciate the time you took Kelly and Karen to share that information with us. Um, one of the things I know is that when it comes to, we think of abuse and child protective services, adult protective services with elders, one of the, one of the factors of abuse. Ooh, I just cut her off. Oh, I think she froze for one second. Um, So sorry about that, um, Judy froze. So um, we wanna thank you guys so much for presenting today. Um, we are so appreciative of it. And if anybody has any questions, um, Karen has her email in the chat, um, feel free or feel free to send us any emails um, and we will see you guys next time. Thank you everyone. Thank, thank you guys so much. Take care, have a great weekend.